I'm so delighted that everyone's gathered here together today because we have some exciting information. Our first topic is looking at the microbiome and what it means in terms of our anatomy and physiology of bowels, bacteria, and brains. First of all, there are more organisms that live in the microbiome than just bacteria. But we're going to focus largely on bacteria, especially tonight. But tomorrow we'll also be looking at other organisms that can inhabit the intestinal microbiome, which would also include yeast, molds, and other small parasites. There are other organisms that can live there. They're not necessarily the ideal organisms to have living there. Ideally, you want a good mix of these healthy bacteria that we call probiotic bacteria. Does anyone know what that word means? Probiotic? Uh, pro means for. <laughs> Biotic means life. So probiotic, for life. These bacteria are supposed to be for life. However, I'll submit to you that even on some uh, health food store shelves, you can buy probiotic bacteria that are not so good for you. Now, in terms of the biosphere, the human body is inhabited in many places with bacteria. We're going to focus on what we see here, the colon and even the small intestine to some extent, and even the stomach. We're going to be studying all of these. But did you know that you have bacteria that flourish on your skin as well? On the skin, there's a whole nother microbiome that we don't have a lot of time to talk about. But for instance, did you realize that there are certain microorganisms that live under here that give a characteristic odor? They produce something called propionic acid, which has a kind of a foul sulfur-like odor, the body odor that uh, we commonly want to get away from. Well, these bacteria inhabit this area here and also over on the back. There are other bacteria that inhabit the hands and the arms um, more predominantly than other areas. And interestingly enough, you know where these bacteria are sourced from? Their highest source in the human body is actually the anal region of the body. So if you think about it, we need to wash our hands more often, don't we? But we're not going to be focusing so much on the skin today. That's a whole other realm of study. We're going to look at the microbiome that we all know of that consists of our large intestine, the matter that resides there in the large intestine in particular. Did you realize that thriving there in a healthy person in your large intestine, you have about potentially 1.5 to 4.5 pounds of microorganisms if you're a 150 pound person. It's usually about one to 3% of your total body mass. Now, that's a lot of organism, okay? And if you really look under the microscope, you'll see that these organisms are not the regular size as human cells. Human cells dwarf these little microorganisms. So if you were to count up all of these microbes, scientists estimate there are more of these bacteria, molds, fungi, whatever they are that's inhabiting the colon, there are more of them in there than us. That's pretty sobering, isn't it? Do you think maybe there's something important going on there in the colon? We used to think the colon, there was no real function for the colon except for uh, extracting a little bit of water uh, and, and drying out the stool. But now studies are showing the colon is the habitation for wonderful mechanisms that promote health or uh, could even devastate our health. So let's go on and let's study a little bit about the history of the um, study of the microbiome. Back in the early 1900s, there was a lot of interest in this topic. And in fact, um, we had such uh, prominent individuals as the editor of the American Journal of Gastroenterology in 1920 uh, come out with statements like this. This was um, Anthony Bassler. He said, It is probable that future years will show that many of the diseases classed today as of obscure origin will be understood to be directly or indirectly due to states of chronic toxemia from the intestinal canal. Chronic toxemia from the intestinal canal. You know what this went on to be known as? 
auto intoxication. In fact, that was the catchphrase that these individuals used. Auto meaning self, right? Intoxication meaning we intoxicate ourselves by the putrid matter that's forming there in the colon. Now, it's kind of an interesting hypothesis, wouldn't you say? How many of you believe that is possible? Okay, very interesting. If you believe that's, a, that's possible, though, you would be very unpopular in the eyes of one very prominent physician and researcher during this time. His name was Dr. Walter C. Alvarez. And I'll tell you why I mentioned this gentleman in just a moment. First, I want to tell you what he said about people that think that the colon has anything to do with our health. It says, in the worst of these cases of auto intoxication, the sufferers are undoubtedly psychopathic. I have learned to recognize this type or the type at the first interview, and I no longer waste much time with them. As it is practically impossible to change their habits of thought, they are generally neurotic or ins of insane ancestry and often give a history of nervous breakdowns in the past. That's quite a strong message, isn't it? Dr. Alvarez represented a class of physicians who took sides against the hypothesis that anything in the gut could come out and cause problems, or auto intoxication was even a plausible theory. And he had some cause to do it, because with any good movement, there sometimes is a move towards fanaticism. And the move towards understanding the microbiome was a movement that was not without such fanaticism. You see, a lot of physicians during this time realized that there was a direct connection between the mood and the gut bacteria. They saw it. They empirically saw it happening. So what they decided was, some of them, that we should recolonize the gut with healthier bacteria, which seemed very plausible. But some physicians said, hey, this is filled with putrefying matter. It doesn't serve any purpose. Let's cut it out and get rid of it. Do you think that helped much? No, not at all. So there are many uh, colectomies or colon resections done, especially in mental institutions. Thousands of these performed by individual doctors even. And they claim this really helped the, the patients overcome depression, anxiety, and so on. Because the theory was you take out all that putrefying matter or fermenting matter and you resolve the issue. But did God create us with this organ? It must have a purpose then. And so this controversy was raging between these different physicians. Some took the extreme view of getting rid of the colon. Some said, hey, we just need to repopulate the colon with healthy bacteria. And others said, you all are psychopaths. We don't believe in that at all. You know what uh, school of thought won out? Sadly, it was Dr. Alvarez's school of thought. And this school of thought continued up until the early 1990s. In fact, if you wrote or, or were to write in an article and mention the term auto-intoxication or, or such things, people would think that you are practicing quackery. You've heard of the term leaky gut? It used to be termed by uh, physicians just absolute nonsense. Doesn't, it couldn't happen. It doesn't make sense. That's a, a man-made um, diagnosis that really doesn't describe any uh, real physiologic threat. But I'll submit to you, studies have shown, and scientists and physicians are realizing now, that the stance that Dr. Alvarez took was completely wrong. Completely wrong. And because of this, we're way behind where we should be in terms of our understanding of how the gut affects our health. But if you look in the uh, medical journals, you'll see a tremendous increase in the amount of research papers that are published looking at this concept. So although we might have been in darkness for a long time, the light is shining upon us right now. And this information I'm about to present to you is from that great light, the newest research that's come out that shows there truly is a connection between our mood and our gut bacteria. 
could it be, could it be that possibly some of the reasoning why approximately one out of every four Americans aged 18 and up suffers from a diagnosable mental disease every year is related to poor gut health? Could it be? Over 25% of Americans suffer possibly from depression, anxiety, uh, or some other type of diagnosable mental disorder. Studies have actually looked at other more obscure forms of um, cognitive impairment, such as autism, and found amazing links between autistic symptoms and what's going on in the gut. Tremendously amazing. In fact, this is one of the reasons why scientists have started studying these subjects more because of the people who have come out and kind of by just persevering and going in the right direction, in the right train of thought in this subject, made headway. I'll give you a, a case in point. I was speaking with a PhD researcher up in Toronto, Toronto Children's Hospital, and he told me that there was a lady there, I believe in Toronto, who brought her child to the pediatrician with an earache. Now what usually happens, what does a child come home with after they go to the pediatrician with an earache? Antibiotic, right? And this is what happened in this case. And so the child went through the whole round of antibiotics and the ear infection went away. But something strange started to happen to this little boy. He started to develop these very strange, repetitive, and affiliative behaviors. He started to kind of withdraw himself from society and be kind of in his own little world. And this happened over a period of, I believe, a few weeks and maybe even into months. And his mother started to get very, very anxious about this developing condition. So she went back to the same pediatrician and said, my son, there's something going on with him. And he wasn't like this before. It seemed as though after he got that round of antibiotics, he started changing. And the physician said, oh, your child has autism. He's always had autism, actually. Doesn't have anything to do with the antibiotics. And so the mom went home just puzzled. What's going on with my son? There's got to be something here. And you know what? This mom did not give up. She went from pediatrician to pediatrician, research scientist to research scientist, until finally she found a group of research scientists that said, hmm, this is an interesting situation. And they had some hypotheses based on some recent studies that had come out, and they said, okay, we'll take your case. Let's put your child back on the same antibiotics that he was on before. They put him on the antibiotics. You know what happened? The autistic symptoms went away. And that really opened a floodgate of study into the link between autism and the bacteria that are living in the gut. It wasn't the antibiotics that really saved the day. It was the fact that he had been on the antibiotics that allowed other bacteria to come in and recolonize his gut that was actually the problem. You see, he developed an infection called C. diff or Clostridium difficile. All of the Clostridia uh, species produce large amounts of that smelly compound known as propionic acid. In small amounts, it may not be harmful, but in large amounts, it's neurotoxic. In fact, if they want to mimic autistic spectrum syndrome in an animal, such as a rat, they'll inject propionic acid into the cerebrum. And you know what? Autistic-like symptoms occur. Since then, studies have shown that it seems as though autistic children have increased intestinal permeability, or as we would know it in the layman's term, they have leaky gut. 36.7% of those with autism, whereas 4.5% in most healthy controls have measurable leaky gut. Even if you don't have autism, it's important for us to know what we can do to heal the gut and to allow it to be colonized by health-promoting bacteria. So, to understand these things, I'll submit to you, we actually need to go to the home of the microbiome. If we're going to understand what bacteria need to be there, first let's go to the house and let's see what happens here. Let's study the function and the structure of the digestive system to know how and when and why we can rebuild a healthy microbiome.
almost all of us probably been on antibiotics at least once in our life. Almost all of us have eaten unhealthy things. We've made mistakes. We've been stressed out. We've lost sleep. If any of those things have happened to us, we probably are suffering somehow in our gut. So let's look at the gut and let's understand how we can get it to be healthier. First of all, let's look at the stomach. You may not think the stomach is really that involved in the microbiome, but it plays a very vital important role. It is kind of like the gatekeeper to the whole entrance into this house where um, bacteria can make the difference between life or death, or fungus can make the difference between life or death in our microbiome. Why is it the gatekeeper? What is the normal pH of the stomach? about two. You know how many bacteria survive in a pH of about two? Not very many. Not very many. We'll talk about those that do, but not very many. And you know the Clostridium species? They are pretty much all wiped out in a healthy stomach. But studies have found that when people are on long-term antacids or proton pump inhibitors, the door opens wide for those Clostridia to come in and infect the small intestine and the large intestine. And there are other things that happen as well. The stomach needs to have proper acidity in order to break down the proteins that come into it. If this doesn't happen, you know what also increases greatly? Food intolerances, food sensitivities, food allergies. You become allergic to the things that you eat because the stomach is not at the correct pH. This can also happen if we drink a lot of water right, with our meals and we water down the, the pH as well. well. Water up in this case, we increase the pH to more alkaline. We need the stomach to be the gatekeeper, the doorkeeper. It needs to serve its function. It will kill most of those unhealthy bacteria if it's working correctly. So let's go on to the small intestines. Who would have thought, but we actually do have some bacterial colonization in the small intestine. Um, not a whole lot, but as it goes down and down and down into its very uh, large uh, lengths, we have more and more bacteria uh, growing. You know something really amazing about this phenomenon, which happens with every meal eventually? You have less bacteria here, but much more over here. And there is a compound known as cobalamin or vitamin B12 that is only produced by bacteria. You can't get it from any other source. If you get it from another source, you know where they got it from? Bacteria. Go to the animals to get it, they got it from bacteria. But you can get it from bacteria as well. In fact, I believe that's the way God intended for us to get vitamin B12. All right, and this is how it works. The stomach still has to be proper acidity because it has to be able to cleave away the proteins from the B12. Um, and then when this happens, uh, we actually have viable B12 coming down here, which could be absorbed, but you need a lot more than what you might even be able to ingest um, initially for diffusion of B12 to take place here in the last part of the small intestine. So what we need to have happen is for bacteria to flourish. What do bacteria need to flourish? Good, healthy food, right? They need fiber. They need some sugar um, of some type. We're, we're hoping that we're going to have the more complex sugars. But they need something good to eat. And they need to be mixed thoroughly with that food so that when they come down here, they have produced a large amount of B12. That same researcher I had the privilege of talking to about a year ago said that he believes the reason why it's not so uh, much of a good idea to eat all different types of varieties, especially between the, the uh, fruit and the vegetable kingdom, is there are different types of bacteria that grow on these uh, plants or these fruits or these vegetables. And you know what happens? They'll produce cobalamin. That's one of their byproducts. But... If they see a threat, you know what they do with the cobalamin? They take it and they turn it into a weapon and they fight each other. So there are wars going on in there in the small intestine. You know what, who gets the vitamin B12? No one because there's so much war. So what we need is a peaceful environment, right? For those bacteria to flourish and to provide you with all the good things that you need. Now let's say 
you get some um, bad bacteria in here for some reason, you have much more absorption that goes on here in the small intestine as it uh, occurs here in the large intestine. If you're afraid of the propionic acid, you definitely don't want propionic acid producing bacteria here in the small intestine. You know what one of the worst things to happen in the small intestine is stress. When we're stressed, you know what the small intestine does? Shuts down. And so think about this. You've got this matter of decomposing plant uh, or, or whatever it is that you've eaten with the bacteria there. And it's just sitting there fermenting or putrefying if we have a large amount of protein. Uh, and it's letting go all these toxic, potentially toxic byproducts. Stress is not a friend to digestion. Many of us have jobs where we just eat something, then we're back in the office, right? We're back on the run. 15 minutes, maybe even 20 minutes, maybe at the most half an hour we have to eat our meals, right? And then we're back at work. That's the worst thing we can do for our digestive tract. But there is something God has given us that is a wonderful protection, protective mechanism here between the intestines and the circulatory system, which will take these potential toxins all throughout the system. And that is a very close-knit group of cells. They're called epithelial cells, and they line the colon and also the inner lining of the small intestine. This is another look here of the cells. Uh, they have these little appendages here, which is, are called uh, villi and crypts. And all along here, absorption takes place. So you get a lot of surface area in a very small space. Um, but there are also immune cells that have their appendages sticking out here. Now notice these cells are very tightly knit together, right? These are called tight junctions, tight gap junctions. And it's very important for you to have tight junctions in your small intestines and your large intestines. Why is that? Because what happens when those split open? What do you think? Leakage, right? There's the leaky gut. The Roman Empire conquered the world in a very short amount of time, and it wasn't because of their swords. It wasn't because of their spears, even though they were quite innovative. It wasn't because of their armor. It wasn't even because, I would say, because of their generalship. You know the reason why they conquered the world? It was because of their shields. Can you imagine coming against an army like this? How do you fight against something like this? Can you? What do you do? You just run into the spear, right? <laughs> because the shields are guarding. These shields are tightly formed. In fact, this configuration was known as the Roman phalanx, and nothing, no arms at that time could prevail against this tight, uh, fortification the Roman army set up called the phalanx. They knitted their shields together, they held the shields together, and even if one of the soldiers fell in battle, someone was right there behind them to move up and to replace that shield. This is how they conquered the world. But I'll submit to you, our small intestines and our large intestines are much more closely configured and capable of guarding against the enemies that might come into the body with their tight junctions than any Roman legion ever was. So let's talk about a few good and bad bacteria. This is just a general look. I actually didn't make up this chart, um, but I do agree with some of the things that are depicted here, such as the fact that the bifidobacteria have been shown to be a healthy strain of bacteria. They actually don't putrefy matter. They won't break down proteins which uh, fermentation of proteins, as we'll learn tomorrow, is one of the most unhealthy things that can happen in our digestive tract. But they won't do it. They refuse to touch it. E. coli. How many of you thought E. coli was terrible? Most people, right? Because they hear, oh, this person got E. coli from this fruit or this vegetable, and so E. coli must be terrible, right? That's not necessarily the case. E. coli is actually, uh, when it's in the colon and it stays there, it's a very healthy or potentially healthy strain of bacteria. There are a few subsets of this bacteria that can cause disease, yes. Um, but we could even have problems from things like E. coli, even the healthy type of E. coli. And this is the reason why. A lot of laboratory studies have found that because of something that is innately 
apparent on the exterior of the E. coli bacteria, it can present quite a few problems. That substance is known as this right here, lipopolysaccharides. Lipopolysaccharides are found on gram-negative bacteria. How many of you have ever heard of sepsis or someone coming down with some type of bacterial infection in the blood, septicemia? Anyone? Okay. It's actually been found that in the bloodstream, the causative factor for the shock occurring for the collapse of the circulatory system is actually not necessarily the bacteria. It's actually the lipopolysaccharides. Why is that? Because lipopolysaccharides in and of themselves, when they can come off of the organism and float around the circulation, they cause tremendous inflammation. So the higher the levels, the higher the levels of inflammation in the body. But in an intact colon, they don't necessarily cause problems. Okay? So that's a good thing, right? Very good thing. But what if we don't have a healthy gut? Then we're potentially in for some problems. This is what happens if we have impaired intestinal permeability or leaky gut. The lipopolysaccharide does not just stay in here. It can come out and build up to higher levels in the blood and then it poses a threat to the brain. Now the brain has its own barrier. This is known as the blood-brain barrier. And this barrier was given by God to prevent toxins and other things that are potentially floating around the circulation from going easily into the brain and causing problems. And it also helps prevent infectious agents from going in there. This is the reason why if you come down with a common cold, you don't automatically get encephalitis or an infected brain because there's a blood-brain barrier there. But this is what lipopolysaccharide can do. Lipopolysaccharide in elevated concentrations has been found to go over to the blood-brain barrier and actually puncture it and punch holes into it. See, now you have these microscopic holes and what some physicians now are calling leaky brain. That doesn't sound like a good thing, does it? Now you can have toxins that are even in the body, inflammatory compounds that are in the body, infectious agents that are in the body, all going into the brain and causing problems. And these problems have been well documented. Lipopolysaccharide administration in low levels has been found to cause acute anxiety, depressive symptoms, cognitive deficits, and even increased sensitivity to aches and pains. So it could be our arth arthritic pains are actually caused not necessarily by a huge case of arthritis, but maybe a leaky brain because of what's going on in our gut. I'm going to show you another gram-negative bacteria. Not just E. coli can cause this problem. Anyone ever heard of H. pylori? Here's another gram-negative bacteria. They have lipopolysaccharide on them. H. pylori infection is actually the number one communicable disease in North America. Now, most of those cases, they're asymptomatic. You don't have symptoms. You don't actually have that ulcer that's being created right here by the eating away of the stomach acid eventually into the epithelial cells in the stomach. But you still potentially have some issues there. I'll submit to you H. pylori is an organism that should not even be in our system. Why is that? It's because they are playing with the gate that can allow other bacteria in that could cause problems. They're actually kind of binding the gatekeeper. And it's a well-known fact that when you have H. pylori infection, you also potentially have much more dangerous species of bacteria that colonize the colon. When this little guy gets in, he opens the door and let, lets all of his bad friends in with him, so to speak. How does he do it? Here's his lipopolysaccharide on his external surface that can cause inflammation as well in the body and even the leaky brain syndrome. But he has another thing over here called urease. And what urease does is it actually causes the production of ammonia. And ammonia, if you know of ammonia, it's a very strong alkaline substance. Now, if you take an acid and an alkaline and put them together, what do you get? A more neutral compound, right? And a lot of gas. 
right? This is why a lot of people with H. pylori infections have burping and belching and all type of heartburn and all type of gas because these little guys are active. When they produce the ammonia, they build kind of a force field around themselves so the stomach acid can't go in and destroy them. Now, how many of you like that? Anyone like these little bacteria? I didn't think that you would. But it's interesting because they're doing the same thing as something like baking soda. I have a, a video on YouTube that's gotten over 500,000 hits, views, on baking soda. And the reason why I placed it on YouTube was because people were taking baking soda by the tablespoon, mixing it with water, and drinking it. And you know what? It does bring about some potentially good side effects initially. But studies have found, along with those antacids and those proton pump inhibitors, if you shut down the acidity of the stomach, you lose your gatekeeper. You have increased um, food sensitivities that are coming about, increased, much more increased risk of infection of the small intestine with some kind of bacteria that you don't want to have growing there, and the potential negative uh, side effects to the brain as well. So how do we get rid of H. pylori? How about we take away their ability to hide and to protect themselves? We can take away the urease. There are many natural things that have urease in inhibition properties. They can inhibit the production of urease in these bacteria. You want to know some of them? Grapes, guava, onions, anything that's high in the quercetins, uh, the quercetin compounds, is potentially going to be able to shut down the growth of these bacteria. So that basically would be a diet that's rich in fruits and vegetables fresh fruits and vegetables, and even cooked onions, they still have a high amount of quercetin. Um, but I can definitely say that um, adding these things to our diet could potentially bring a lot more positive side effects even than killing this bacteria. Other studies have found that broccoli sprouts, a sulfur compound um, that's very high in the broccoli sprouts in particular, it's high in broccoli as well, but the sprouts have an exceptional amount of this it actually kills, selectively goes and kills this one bacteria. It doesn't touch the other beneficial bacteria that are colonizing the gut, but it goes and it destroys these H. pylori. How many of you have a new appreciation for broccoli sprouts? You know, it's amazing because when that study was first published, uh, actually a little bit afterward, broccoli seeds, the prices went sky high <laughs> because people started to appreciate it more. Uh, because it really is potentially helpful in this case. But we don't want these active infections stealing our health. Let's look at the concept of what happens when we feed the body things that potentially could increase production of lipopolysaccharide. It's been found that high fructose corn syrup is the worst sweetener for our brain and for our gut based on the lipopolysaccharide. Uh, elevated levels. Actually, studies have found that fructose syrup administration increases circulating lipopolysaccharide by about 40 percent. That's quite a bit. And that's versus sucrose and glucose. It's also interesting, a fact here, Western style diets, which are traditionally high fat, low fiber, high refined carbohydrates, high protein, the Western style diet for one month can elevate plasma lipopolysaccharide levels by 71% above the baseline. And in contrast to that, switching over to a low fat, high fiber, low saturated fat diet, which is uh, a more healthy diet, typically a more plant-based diet, for one month can decrease baseline LPS levels by about 38%. So let me ask you a question. Which is a bigger difference? The unhealthy diet produces about 71% elevated levels of the lipopolysaccharides, right? The healthy diet reduces them by about 38%. So is it really worth it to eat unhealthy foods? So it's really important for us, if we want to heal the gut, to be strict about it in a, in a nice way, you know, in an enjoyable way, but to persevere and to try uh, with all of our might by all of the grace that God gives us 
to bring about a healthy condition in the gut. It really makes a difference what we feed it. How many of you have heard of gluten sensitivities? What happens with gluten sensitivities or celiac disease as a uh, more dramatic case? We have a destruction of the normal, healthy, small intestine. So what's happening here is the villi and the crypts, this huge um, surface area that we can digest our nutrients from, it gets broken down and it looks more like this. Which has more surface area? By far, the healthy small intestine, right? So people with celiac, they have much less ability even to digest their food, to absorb their nutrients. It's very scary. And you know, the same thing can happen. Destruction of this lining can happen when our colon is gotten into a, a state of things where it's unhealthy, where the immune system is attacking it. Could be some chronic degenerative disease we've developed like Crohn's or IBS or even food sensitivities. But we need to heal the gut. If we want to fix leaky gut, we need to go to the gut and bring healing to those cells. That's how we're going to fix it. An amazing study found that one of the most healing things and health promoting things to the gut is actually mother's milk. There's a compound that's there in mother's milk known as oxytocin. Now, oxytocin is the love hormone. It's, uh, in fact, and it's also a, a letdown hormone. It allows the mother to produce more milk. Uh, when women are breastfeeding and let's say they're having a busy lifestyle and they have to pump uh, some of that breast milk and give the, to the father to give to the baby in a bottle, they're encouraged to put a picture of the baby on that pump. Why is that? Because they'll look at them and they'll love them and more oxytocin will be produced and they'll have more milk actually being produced. Okay? And you know what? A lot of that oxytocin gets put into the milk. Now other studies have found that in mother's breast milk, there are actually probiotic lactobacilli naturally present that seem to be somehow taken from the mother's digestive tract and put there. They're not due to contamination. They've ruled that out in these studies. So what we find is they're the ideal food for the growing gut is full of things that encourage the growth, that stimulate the growth of the colon, and full of oxytocin. In the newborn epithelial lining, something very strange can happen. It's not really used to seeing bacteria when it's uh, there in the mother's womb, but when it comes out, it's inundated with bacteria. And sometimes you can have a reaction where the immune cells, their appendages that are sticking out here, they sense there's some bacteria coming in and they'll produce a tremendous amount of inflammatory compounds and could cause destruction in parts of the colon. And you may not even realize, you may wonder, well, why is my baby not growing as he should or she should? Maybe it's because this has not been primed yet. And especially this is the case in formula-fed babies. Studies have found that the oxytocin that's found in mother's milk somehow communicates to the immune cells of the colon and says, hey, you're gonna see bacteria soon, don't worry about them. Just be healthy. Quite interesting, huh? Oxytocin conditions the gut cells to be tolerant of high levels of lipopolysaccharides. That's there in the gut. Oxytocin prepares them, right? Where is oxytocin produced? The love. It's the love hormone, right? Love prepares the gut to face bacteria. That's quite an interesting lesson, isn't it? What else does oxytocin do to the gut? When the oxytocin is passed through the large intestine, the size of the villi increase and the size of the crypt increase. So you know what that means? More absorptive area, which means you can get more nutrients out of your food because of the oxytocin. That's amazing, isn't it? So, this presents a question for us. Very intriguing question. Recently, a large study um, done over in Sweden of 1.3 million people found that premature birth, which was characterized by antibiotic use to control the flora in the gut, 
and no mother's milk in many cases was associated with 30% increased risk of depression and listen to this, 270% increased risk of bipolar disorder. Could it be that we have for the past 70, 80 years really done humanity a disservice by thinking there's no connection between the gut and the brain? Could it be? Think about all those children with autism that have been suffering. Now, there are probably other causative factors, not just what's happening in the gut. They could bring about the autistic syndrome, and studies seem to validate that. But this plays a huge part in it right here. And I'll submit to you, the solution to all of this may be a lot easier than we realize. In fact, studies have found that oxytocin may play a role in autism. Oxytocin is not a very easy thing to get into the body, into the brain at least. But when they actually uh, use nasal spray, they could actually get it into the brain of these subjects. By the way, you can't get oxytocin nasal spray. They, they deemed it would be unethical for people to get their love from a, a nasal spray. They'd be walking around and getting love from the wrong places. Um, in love with their, their bottles of this nose spray. But in these studies, they use this, and it found some startling results. In fact, it found that children with autism, when they were treated with this oxytocin, they stopped their repetitive and affiliative behaviors. Their autistic spectrum symptoms decreased significantly. Now think about that. Where does oxytocin naturally come from? It comes from love, right? It comes from love. So let's put all these things together here for a minute because I think we might have stumbled across something really amazing. What does love do to the colon? It increases the nutrient gathering capacity, right? It helps to fix our damaged tissues there and potentially could help with these mental disorders even in a indirect relationship. But you know one of the most important things about love brings us back to our first few slides. Love does what? It hopes all things, right? It believes all things and it endures all things. Now we've made many blunders in terms of medical science in the past hundred years. One of the greatest blunders could have been prevented if we had just been more willing and open to investigate the potential link between the gut and the brain.